Last call, anybody? Uh, Hyun. Okay, Hyun. Okay, I took a risk last uh, fall to keep my two employees, keep paying them salary uh, out of, um, I only had two guys working, but we, six of us, Lynn and I, and uh, two uh, people that I could push them out to unemployed, but I, instead of train them, uh, I really am interested in ADA uh, area of working. So today, Lynn and I talk about it already. Today, I'm celebrating all my four guys, two guys that I haven't kept in, <laughs> kept them in my payroll for uh, how many months is September? Now they are out there working, two of them. So I'm celebrating. I guess uh, it's a time for me to make them to make some money so I won't go bro uh, broke. So we have non unemployment. Um, we don't have anybody. I push them, push them out to unemployed, but they're working today. So that's my celebration. And what is. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. What is. Yeah, one is an immigrant. He's an uh, engineer, and uh, this country uh, do not recognize uh, the experience in other countries. So I train him through Mindad. So not only I uh, they got payrolls, but uh, I put uh, put the bill to get all the trainings. So they got all the proper trainings to go out in the highway to do inspection. So I'm very happy. Awesome. Thank you. Um, anybody else for happy dollars? Okay, move on to announcements then. Um, so I mentioned earlier, but Taste of Rose Fest has been canceled this year, and we are looking for new ideas for creative virtual fundraising. So if anybody has any ideas, please uh, let me know of your ideas, and we'll regroup and try and figure out something different. Uh, Snelling Avenue Spring Road cleanup is uh, this Saturday, 9 o'clock. Even though the governor's got to stay at home, we're going to go out and do the cleanup and keep us good social distance from each other so we don't have to worry about it. It's outside. Um, the other thing is the Roseville Rotary Board made a donation to the uh, Suburban Ramsey COVID-19 Response Fund. And we're also looking for anybody who wants to be on committees and you can also make an individual or a company donation uh, for more information on our, on our bulletin. Uh, Julie Wern, and we'd like to talk about that. Julie on? Hello, Julie? I don't think she got her audio connected. Yeah, I don't see her on here. Jan, do you want to do something on that? I, I was uh, part of the meeting of we met last week with uh, Kent Peterson, who's organizing it from the uh, Shoreview Rotary. And uh, this, this committee uh, or uh, coalition is really a, a combination of several service agencies, including you know, service organizations, including the Lions, Kiwanis, and uh, of course the Optimus, because they're always optimistic. And, uh, and school districts and Ramsey County and other government agencies. And what it's tr working on doing is setting up a, a fund that can address emergency needs as they come up in uh, one of the things they're doing right now, uh, you know, as they first have their first uh, little bit of money in, uh, is, is helping with the Ralph Reeder uh, food shelf, things like that. Uh, and they look at it farther out and think of this as a community-wide effort to, to save and work with our community. Uh, they are uh, registered at Give, to, uh, uh, Give Minnesota. And uh, this week, I understand that if you go and donate there, uh, that will be a match donation from somebody. And I, I don't remember who it was. But the overall goal here is to look around in our community at our businesses and, and such that would like to be helpful in the community and know that this is there to do that. Now, this is a, a little different than what we talk about with our Roseville Foundation or the, the uh, I mean, the Rotary Foundation, which works on a disaster project grant basis, but that's kind of specifically, it, it takes a bit of time. It's got to be kind of organized. This is going to be more of a fast twitch. Something's got a problem. We can take care of it and get help there as it's needed on a timely basis. And so, you know, uh, 
they're looking for people to be part of the committees as well as uh, kind of the leadership. Uh, it's really going to be right now. It, it's in the fundraising stage, but they're already meeting to see, see if they can do the, put their first grant together. Again, you can go back to Give Minnesota, and you can see their uh, beginning web page. They they are going to build another web page, a real web page, and and uh, but that's kind of preliminary. Another thing about this organization, it's all volunteers. There won't be any uh, salaries or overhead, as far as I can tell. And I kind of got that strong impression from the guys we were talking to. Good people, all of them. All right, thanks, Jan. Yeah, it's actually um, the Give Men website is matching through the 8th, and it is uh, the Bush Foundation is matching all donations uh, through the 8th of this month. Um, and so um, with that, I think Julie's on. So um, you saw that earlier, but uh, this Thursday is the 50th anniversary of Roosevelt Rotary, which was chartered on May 7th, 1970. So um, unfortunately, we were not able to have our get together celebratory dinner, but um, just want to make a point that this is, it happened 50, 50 years ago this week. Anybody else have any other uh, announcements they'd like to make? Well, maybe we could just do a virtual cheers. I'd uh, maybe take the thing down and just say cheers. Congratulations to us. May we have 50 more. Cheers. Hooray, hooray. Cheers. Hooray, hooray. I, I, this is Hyun again. I came to this country in 1970 uh in november so wow roseville rotary we have same uh year anniversary <laughs> so okay uh, this With, is kathy hewitt i just wanted yep. to add something from julie warren she can hear us but she's she's muted on her iphone and it's not unmuting but she wanted to remind everyone that i'll be sending the flyer out with the newsletter so keep an out watch out for that on the, okay. on the coalition. On the coalition, yeah. All right, with that, I'll ask uh, Deb to uh, introduce, introduce today's speaker. All right, we're really excited today to be joined by Patrick Mader. Um, he goes by Packy. He has a background in education, business, and agriculture with a professional career as an elementary teacher and is the author of six books. He grew up on a dairy farm near St. Bonifacius, Minnesota and has been a lifelong fan of sports at all levels, leading to the creation of two 400-page nonfiction books, Minnesota Gold and More Minnesota Gold. The new book includes Minnesota's only five-time Olympian, um, world record holders in running and swimming, and how these remarkable athletes give back to their sport, school, and community. He and his wife, Karen, live in Northfield and are the parents of two children. Help me to welcome Patrick Mader. Thank you. Um, Deb, you might have to coach me through this share screen option then. I'm yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> so, um, Patrick, if, are you on a PC or a Mac? I'm on a PC. Okay, so if you um, look at the bottom of your screen, there's a green button that says share screen. Yep. So click on that. Okay. And then pick out the open tab that you have for your, it's a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Do you have it open already? Uh, I'm trying to open it at this moment. Okay. There, do you see it? Um, nope. So go back to go back to Zoom. Okay. And then click on that green button that just says share screen. Okay. And then um, do you have any audio? No, just okay. my own. So then the, the bottom right hand says share. There, it's working. 
Okay, good, because I don't see it. <laughs> oh, okay. Right now we have um, we have the we're seeing your Zoom file. Okay. So you may have um, when you went to share screen, you probably didn't click on your production. So um, why don't you exit the shared screen? If you go up to the top, okay, you should say stop sharing. All right. Uh, boy. Okay, I can do new share. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, I see it. Kathy, yeah, we're seeing your screen. There it is. We got it. Okay. No. Great. Okay. Well, thank you uh, to the Roseville Rotary Club members for letting me try this. And I apologize if there are any glitches. Uh, Kathy was. Our Deb was very kind and had the foresight to try and do a dry run with me, but uh, we will see now that we have an audience and other things going on. I'd like to thank the Rotary in general for, first of all, all the things you do globally as well as locally, but also personally for our family because out of 310 graduates at Northfield High School, our son received the Northfield Rotary Scholarship when he graduated from high school. And we appreciate that. Um, it, it helped our family financially. It was a big, um, pleasant surprise to our son. And anyway, thank you very much. Um, I got this idea to do a book about Minnesota Olympians and world-class athletes, uh, partly because I taught Minnesota history as part of our elementary program, and also because I just always loved sports. Uh, because of our farm, I wasn't able to do sports myself, but I was a faithful follower on the radio of any gopher sports, high school sports that were carried, and of course the professional sports. Um, I got the, when, once I had the idea, to my surprise, there's never been a book written about Minnesota Olympians. So I actually covered the whole state because I wanted a variety. So I went from Rosso to Albert Lee, from War Road to uh, Winona, Moorhead to Duluth and all points in between. I actually went to 85 of Minnesota's 87 counties to do the research, the interviews and presentations. And everywhere I went, it was, it just made me very proud of our state. Um, the Olympic rings are a sign that unfortunately are, is being postponed this year. But the reason for the five rings are because they represent the continents. Antarctica does not have any permanent inhabitants, so it's not represented. And the Americas were put together at one time when the Olympics were formed. So that's the reason for five rings instead of six or seven. Just some basic information about the Olympics. Uh, once I started doing the research, I learned that Minnesota has way more Olympians than most states of the same size. And the reason is because of our environment. The cold and the snow have allowed Minnesotans to be successful in particularly hockey, curling, and Nordic skiing uh, sports, and they've been quite successful. So our environment has really helped us quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure if any of you recognize this 1956 Olympian, but if you look at him, I think it'll come to mind for many of you. Governor Wendy Anderson. He was a defenseman on the 1956 Olympic team that won a silver medal. Here he is uh, in uniform. He became the youngest governor in the nation in 1970 at the age of 37. But even when he was governor and all the way until he was 78 years old, he played hockey. Uh, the only reason he quit was when he was 78, he had just scored a goal and he was a little too celebratory and ended up breaking his wrist. So that put a halt to his uh, athletic and hockey career. Uh, when I finished writing the book, I stopped by to visit him again and I gave him a copy. And it's, this picture was actually um, after he and I spent a couple hours together and he was very alert, very funny, uh, but he died eight months later. So this was taken shortly before his death. Another Minnesota Olympian that uh, many people might recognize 
is Lindsey Whalen. She talked more about the pride of her hometown than any other athlete I interviewed, and I interviewed over 100. Uh, she came to Minnesota as not a very acclaimed high school athlete, and, but she turned the program around along with some other Minnesotans. They were, I think they had only won two games the year before she joined the team. By the time she left, they were winning 21 and made the final four. Uh, she went on to a very successful professional career, leading the team to four championships. And she was the leading scorer in the 2016 uh, gold medal game that the U.S. won. Uh, I really uh, respect Lindsay a lot. She and I did a joint program in her hometown of Hutchinson, and you can see my banner in the background there while Lindsay's speaking. She brought her gold medals that day to the elementary school. She came at nine o'clock. She talked for about an hour. She stayed the rest of the day until every kid in the school got their picture taken with the gold medals and or her. Um, I wanted to highlight some of the Roseville athletes. Uh, this is Lee Steckline. She was a member of the 2018 Women's um, Olympic gold medal team. She was also uh, not only a star player in high school, but at the University of Minnesota. She was on the only undefeated uh, women's hockey team ever in the United States, collegiate team in the United States. Uh, she was on the 2014 Olympic team as well as the 2018, and she has goals to being on the 2022 team as well. Another person from Roseville, uh, she left uh, when after she graduated from high school. Her name was Sarah Riling. She accepted a scholarship to Indiana University, uh, became an All-American diver, she was actually a phenomenal gymnast when she was young, but she, doing a flip, she landed rather awkwardly, and the doctor recommended she quit gymnastics because of landing on a hard surface. Uh, they were very worried that she might become paralyzed because the injury had been so severe. She begged the doctor to let her compete in some kind of sport, and he said, well, it has to be a sport that gives. And so she went to diving and quickly became a star. Here she is with her synchronized diving partner at, from Indiana. She made the team individually and in pairs. Here's another Roseville athlete. His name is Randy Bartz. He won a silver medal in speed skating on short track. Uh, he was a great all-around athlete. He was the starting center fielder on a team that went to state. He was the starting safety on the football team. And then in the winter, he uh, competed in speed skating. Uh, his father is Ran uh, Ron Bartz, who was a pharmacist in Roseville. Randy got a uh, degree in mechanical engineering, and he owns a small company now in Hopkins. Uh, there he is with his father after he won his silver medal. Another person that's got a Roseville connection is Steve Surtich. He's actually from Virginia, Minnesota, and made the Olympic hockey team in 1976, but he became uh, both the boys' coach for a while and the girls' coach at Roseville Area High School. And here he is with his sons, um, Marty on the left, who became the Hobie Baker Award winner for the best collegiate hockey player in the nation. And on the right is his other son, Mike, who also uh, played collegiately. And then after he coached the Roseville teams for many years, uh, he accepted a position as the Bemidji State women's hockey coach. And he continued to coach there until he died, or until, I'm sorry, until he retired. <laughs> um, some people have asked um, who would have been um, a possible medal contender in the 2020 Olympics had they been held. And this woman, very young woman, 17 years old from Lakeville named Reagan Smith, is probably the top candidate, uh, partly because she is the current world record holder in the 200 meter backstroke. Uh, she's double jointed and she can do rather remarkable things with her arms. She's very quiet, modest young woman. Uh, I'm really cheering for her. I hope the Olympics happen next year and that she can 
not participate. That's a picture of her after she set the world record. Another person who's um, more from the Roseville area is Isabel Stadden. She placed third in the U.S. championships in uh, the 200 meter backstroke. Uh, there was Reagan Smith from Lakeville first and then some other competitor and then another Minnesotan. So two out of the three top swimmers in backstroke in the, uh, in the nation are from our state. Um, just quickly about this uh, pair of brothers who are uh, ski jumpers. They're from uh, Golden Valley. Uh, the one on the left is Jerry, and then pictured to, to the right is his older brother, Jay. They were both two-time Olympians, and you can tell by the height difference that there's it's a gap in ages as well. The one on the left, Jerry, is really a remarkable, uh, has a really remarkable story. When he was um, trying to earn money to prepare for the Olympic trials in 1972. He worked for a, a plaster company and he pounded a nail into the, to build the, set the scaffolding and it rebounded and it hit his eye and he actually went blind three months before the trials. He decided to go ahead and participate nevertheless and he uh, won not he won the trials and he went to the Olympics and he finished in the middle, despite having no sight in one eye. Uh, he remained blind in that eye for 20 years and then technology and optical surgery advanced enough that 20 years later, he had an operation at the University of Minnesota and his sight is restored. Uh, a couple other play people from near the Roseville area are these wrestlers. Um, they were twin brothers, never wrestled in their lives until at the end of the high school years. They were just so acrobatic, though, and they eventually qualified for the Olympics and the World Championships. I'm going to pause and just let anybody who has questions or wondering about a certain athlete um, or a comment, if they want to just break in and um, go, please feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dave Gover said, I actually wrestled with the Hazel Uncle Green Twins, and uh, just before that, I tried out for the Olympics myself in 68, and uh, the coach uh, was, was from um, Noka uh, Coon Rapids area uh, of the uh, Greco-Roman team that the Hazel Uncles were wrestling on, and I worked out with them and a lot of the other Greco-Roman team, even though I I didn't go to the Olympics uh, that year. That's that's very interesting. Uh, you were an elite company. Yeah, well, I, I, I also uh, wrestled the uh, uh, a guy named Kosro Vaziri, uh, who uh, was a became a professional wrestler. Um, anyway, that's another story. It was known as the Iron Sheik. Oh, yes, I remember the name. Well, he was still a legitimate wrestler when I wrestled him. Um, the, some people ask about Vern Gagne, and he actually was not an Olympian. Uh, it's Even in his obituary, it said he was, but he was actually an alternate. Um, he was a phenomenal wrestler at the collegiate level for the University of Minnesota and also played football but he never actually was on the Olympic team. He may have gone to the Olympics as the alternate, though. But his anybody agent, else, anybody uh, else have questions? Or? Yeah, yeah his, uh, his agent was always hanging around the University of Minnesota uh, wrestling room uh, trying to recruit people to become professional wrestlers. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, did you meet any para-Olympics? So, um, yes. Okay. Um, both books I wrote have two Paralympians in them. The first book has a blind Paralympian named Jim Mastro from Minneapolis and also a runner from, uh, she now lives in Anoka, I believe. Her name is Lindsay Nielsen. In the second book, uh, there is a wheelchair basketball woman Olympi Paralympian named Rose Hollerman, who I actually taught. Uh, and then there is another 
uh, Paralympian in city volleyball named Lexi Shiflett. Both of those Olympians, Paralympians are quite young and they are expected to make the next Paralympic team too. And the uh, second book I wrote also has one special Olympian, a figure skater named Holly Kawa. I have, a, I have a question. I was just asking. This is Mary Jo. Hi. Thanks. Hi. This is really interesting. I'm just curious um, uh, if you want to comment on Jesse Diggins, who I think is one of our most recent, she's one of our most recent Olympians, uh, right? I, I just wondered uh, who are some of the ones, I, I was trying to think of anyone else, and you, you probably are going to get to them. Okay. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm actually going to page a slide ahead here because um, there it is. Ah. There's Jessie Diggins. Um, she's the little child in the backpack. Wow. Um, her parents got her exposed to cross-country skiing quite a bit. A cute little story is uh, she remembers this, actually. She said she was two to three years old, and she remembers pulling on her dad's hat and yelling mush um, as he would be skiing. Uh, wow. She is... Uh, only five feet four inches and if you saw her like on a college campus you would just think oh nice young athletic looking um co uh, collegiate student but she is muscle bound she's and she's so determined so quick uh, of course she got a lot of acclaim for being on the winning relay that won the gold medal for the united states it was the first gold medal ever won by uh, cross-country skiers in the United States and the first medal ever won by women Nordic skiers. Um, she is getting quite a bit of fame right now. She was responsible for bringing the uh, World Cup race to Golden Valley at Theater Worth Park, which got canceled because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as well as the snow conditions weren't great, but I think they would have pulled it off. Um, very popular, very, she, she's personality plus. Uh, they actually invited me to their home. Uh, or I had two interviews with her and the second time they interviewed me, uh, I interviewed her at their home in Afton. Very friendly family. Anybody else she, have questions or? I just want to say she's been great. We've been working with her in Ramsey County because she's helping us with our winter recreation area for the East Metro. She trained at Battle Creek in Ramsey County and she's been really helping us try to get that as a winter rec area. So she's really given back to the community and I, I just love that about her. I think a lot of Olympians do, but I just have appreciated all the work that she's doing to make sure that other kids have the opportunities that she's had. So it's great. She's got, she's got the platform now and and, and you're absolutely right. I did not run across a single Olympian, um, and I interviewed 108, that does not give back. Um, most give back to their sport, but some give back so much to their community, and even their schools. I mean, like Lindsay Whalen, you saw going back to Hutchinson and giving a full day free of charge. I mean, she did not get anything for being there all day just to connect with the kids. And that's part of the reason this project has been so rewarding to me. Um, I'm just going to go back a little bit, um, just because you may find this of interest. Um, this is Henry Boucher. And for those of you who follow hockey, he was a legend from War Road, Minnesota. He's Ojibwe. Uh, I did try to put as much diversity as possible in the books. As far as I can tell, there have been seven African-American uh, Olympians from Minnesota and two Native Americans. And I did put in, I believe, six of the African Americans and one of the Native Americans in the book. And Henry is one of the Native Americans. Uh, he was embarrassed by his heritage when he was young. He tried to ignore it and avoid it. And then later on, he actually became quite proud of it. And he even taught Indian education for five years. Um, he, those of you who follow hockey may know that he was blindsided when he was playing professionally. An opposing player actually took his stick and swung it in his face, and it caused severe eye injury. Uh, he had double vision, um, and he had to quit hockey. Uh, he still suffers from some um, from it a little bit. Uh, this is what he looks like now. He and I did a joint presentation, uh, and 
he's uh, says he still sometimes experiences headaches, still sometimes has vision problems from that injury, which happened. I would estimate that was more than 40 years ago now. Uh, another person that uh, he lives in Shoreview, so that's part of the reason I wanted to bring him to your attention. And he was the one person I interviewed from the 1980 Miracle on Ice hockey team is Buzz Schneider. He was on a line with two other Minnesota players. They were called the Conehead Line, if you're familiar with the movie Miracle on Ice. Uh, Buzz Schneider played the right wing. The left wing was John Harrington from Virginia, and the center was Mark Pavelich from uh, Evelyn. Um, and Buzz was actually going off the ice, and Harrington and Pavelich were still on the ice when Pavelich made the pass to Mike Ruzion, who scored the winning goal in the game against the Soviet Union. Uh, and when they did the movie, of course, the players were 30 to 35 years older, so they couldn't play themselves in the movie. So they had open auditions to anybody who was a skilled hockey player. They had, I think it was 3,800 people try out. And they kept cutting people, of course, because they couldn't skate as well as they claimed, or they couldn't memorize lines very well, or they weren't really talented in acting. Finally, they got down to the 20 players who were going to represent the 20 players on the US Olympic team. And unknown to the casting director, the person he chose to play Buzz Schneider was Buzz's son, Billy. <laughs> so there's a picture of Billy's wedding there. So Billy plays his father, Buzz, in the movie. So the so when you see Schneider on the uniform, it truly is a Schneider. And I'll pause again if anybody has comments or questions about any of these athletes. Can you, can you tell us anything about the uh, speed skater coach, Bill Cushman? Yes. Um, he was not an Olympian, but he's, of course, in, integral uh, in the speed, speed, speed skating world, especially Midway, where he coached, among other people, Minnesota's only five-time Olympian named Amy Peterson from Maplewood. She raves about Bill and Tom Cushman and what they've contributed to uh, speed skating. Uh, they were instrumental in getting the John Rose Oval uh, built, and Midway Speeding, Speed Skating Club has probably produced at least 10 to 15 Olympians, and Bill and Tom Cushman were important in the development of all of them. Thank you. This is Lynn. Um, this is so inspiring to hear about these different stories and these people. Um, I'm really inspired by that. I'm wondering um, how, and this is an assumption, but um, how you were changed by this experience of uh, interviewing and meeting all of these people and um, having to hear their story firsthand and writing about it. Uh, what changed for you in the midst of that? Well, the thing that really changed for me was um, I thought as a kid growing up, I mean, these were almost like heroes to me, uh, some of the ones who were a bit older than me, but I followed their careers. And I just thought there's no way they'll ever talk to me. I'm an unknown writer. Uh, I, I have this big dream of doing a book about Minnesota Olympians and they're famous. And I was prepared for a lot of rejection, and I got almost none. Uh, only two or three people said they did not want to be part of the book. And it wasn't because they had big egos. Um, one is just very private, and one just told me he had a bad experience at the Olympics and he didn't really want to talk about it. So the thing that I found most surprising to me or most inspiring was, first of all, they were <clears throat> so approachable. And then secondly, they, the, how they overcame obstacles, primarily injuries, but sometimes money, 
uh, under being underfunded, you know, holding two or three part-time jobs while they were training. Uh, their determination. Some people tried for 16 years before they made an Olympic team. That's pretty inspiring to me. Uh, not giving up on your dreams and their goals. Uh, I, I really respect them for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else? I have a few other slides to show if you're interested and have time. Otherwise, uh, I'll just put this up in case if any of you want to call me and just talk about something um, or uh, send an email or order one of the books, um, please know that or just learn more about the athletes because there's sample stories on my uh, web page. Please know that I always have time to talk about this. It's something dear to my heart. Uh, I only did living Olympians and Minnesota again has more than 300 and I did 108. So there are a couple hundred out there that I would love to do, but I probably won't have the opportunity to do so. I have one question. Sure. So the relationship between these athletes over the years with the University of Minnesota, how did the University of Minnesota help them to achieve their goal? Well, they were, they're kind of limited. Uh, they can help them greatly while they're in college. But after that, they really are, and probably because of restrictions, you know, um, conflict of interest types of uh, restrictions, they can't really help them much after that other than you know, profiling them and trying to uh, promote them a little bit. They can't help fund them. But for example, Bush Schneider, um, he got, he made the Olympic team in 1976 as well as the uh, Miracle on Ice 1980 team. And he had just um, completed his eligibility at the University of Minnesota. So he was an integral part of the team when he was at the new and really honed his skills and gave Herb Brooks, his college coach, a lot of credit for that. Um, of all the athletes I did, I would say about um, 20 to 25% of the ones I interviewed um, went to the University of Minnesota. The others uh, went out state or to my surprise, uh, I believe I documented about 12 actually went to division three colleges. And that was a big surprise to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlie Charlie Rice was uh, was the local Olympic. Well, he wasn't local. He was the Greco Roman Olympic coach in '72, and uh, he used the University of Minnesota wrestling room and facilities uh, to, for the his uh, team to practice. That that is true. Uh, it's Alan Rice, I believe. Uh, well, in I, fact, I, he, did I say Charlie? Alan. Yeah. Rice. Yeah. In fact, I interviewed Alan. Uh, he's one of the people I uh, featured in my first book. And uh, you're correct about that. And I had forgotten that they did let people use their facilities. Don Tim is another person who said he did a lot of training at the track. So uh, they did do that. But um, I'm not sure that, you know, anymore that that would be probably an issue. Um, Sometimes they just get the keys from a coach that kind of does it um, surreptitiously, you know, uh, you know, not making um, because their students should get priority, of course. So that I'm not sure how much of that happens anymore. Any other questions or comments that I could or if there's a certain per individual that you're interested in learning about, um, I'd be happy to share uh, what I know about them because I pretty much know the name of every Minnesota Olympian. It's just a matter of whether I interviewed them or um, they, uh, or they're included in my book. But I, I was wondering yeah. about uh, Eric Strobel and McClanahan. They were on the uh, Miracle on Ice. 1980 Olympic team. Yes, they were. Eric Strobel was from Rochester and Rob McClanahan, I believe, was Moundsview. Um, I did not interview them. Uh, Eric Stro 
Strobel, I believe, had a stroke. Um, he's, I believe he's recovered quite well from it. But the reason I did Bud Schneider was I interviewed um, the team physician for the Miracle on Ice team. And I said, if you had to pick one individual on the 1980 team rep who really represents Minnesota the best, who would it be? And he said, Bud Schneider. And Buzz accepted my request for an interview right away. So that's why I did him. And then in the second book, I did John Harrington simply because I had the connection with him because uh, through Buzz. So that was the reason that I chose those two. Any other questions? Okay, with that, thank you very much, Patrick. It was a very interesting topic. We really enjoyed it. Uh, we do you. make a contribution in honor of our speakers to the Rotary Woods and Rain Garden in the Central Park Auditor or Arboretum in Roseville. Um, so thank you again for presenting today. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, so with that, next week's program is Al 